Hi, welcome back to Politico's AI Summit. I'm Laura Kelly, I'm a technology reporter. And welcome to our panel discussion on AI lost in translation. We have two guests with us um, this evening. Hi, thank you for being with us. We have Nicola Miail, who's co-founder and president of the Future Society and director of the AI Initiative and Song Bing, who's vice president of the Bergrigan Institute and director of China Center. So our, ses our session will explore how AI principles are perceived differently from a culture to another, what values mean for different cultures, how we can reconcile all of this. And to start, we have an audience poll. So the question that you're all invi invited to answer to is, how can the U EU, US, and China reconcile culture differences on artificial intelligence? Is it with finding common definitions, defining common guidelines within international bodies such as the UN, or adopt similar laws? So you can reply to this during the, the panel. Uh, so to start the discussion with a, a more general question for, for both of you. Is AI a cultural matter? Nicola Mai, do you wanna do you wanna start? Yeah, I can I can give a step at that. So a quick version is yes, of course. AI is a cultural matter. AI as a manifestation is a as a deeply social technical notion that uh, masters imaginaries, particularly social technical imaginaries, with views and appetites for risk that differ. Um, Europeans are more precautionary and a bit technophobic or techno-realist, and certainly more uh, precautionary than, let's say, the US or China, who are way more proactionary and technophilic. And not even to talk about the so-called global south, which is bound to be more technophilic uh, and proactionary because of the urgency of development. So by definition, because of the situations in these different uh, poles, yeah, of course, it is cultural. And it's also cultural by nature because values do not exist in a vacuum. Uh, they're embedded in a culture. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, the now defunct uh, Democratic Republic of Germany had a democratic constitution. The text was democratic. But we know that it was far in its culture from being democratic. And if you look at the uh, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, it's the same thing. So it's not only uh, when you express in the text certain values that they are going to be manifest in reality uh, in the context if the culture and a, no a number of institutions are not uh, in place. So the short version is, yes, it is indeed. Uh, deeply cultural. What about you, Bing? What do you think? Um, okay, so my short answer will be yes and no. Okay, so uh, let me elaborate this a little bit uh, because it's important for the later discussion as well. I think when we talk about the cultures, clearly we cannot avoid talking about values. So for value discussion, I would like to share with the audience that my three-tiered framework Okay, one is foundational, and the, the, the second one is intermediary, and then surface level values. Okay, that's my analytical framework of that. Um, in my view, foundational values speak to the totality of, of humans and other forms of being. Okay, and then at this level, we see values such as interconnectedness, connectivity, relationality mutual embeddedness and co-survival. Um, at this fundamental level, cultural differences lose their significance and actually do not matter as much. Um, those are the values which matter in the discussion of existential risks of, human, uh, of, of humans and the global challenges such as the global pandemic as we are witnessing right now and you know when we plan for a common planetary future. So. I would say, methodologically speaking, this foundational value level of thinking is about holistic, okay, symbiotic thinking, okay? So that's sort of a foundational level. Let me first talk about the surface level. The surface level is because of the modernization, globalization, there has been a 
conversion and convergence of values along the lines of seeking prosperity, wealth creation, efficiency, convenience, and competition, okay? And then at the surface level, culture differences have, be, have been subdued, okay, I would say. And then so that's why you see the developmental goals globally, okay? It doesn't really matter which culture and then, uh, you know, which corner of the world that you're from. Um, at the intermediate level, that's where culture really matters. And that's the part that I, I you know, uh, completely agree with Nicola. That's essentially how certain applications may be used, people's general attitudes towards AI and the risk assessments and how values have been prioritized, um, how social goals have been balanced against the individual rights protection and, and then the form of government and the culture of governance, okay? All those things, um, you know, contribute to the different um, understanding or, or, or deployment of AI in different cultures and different societies. So I would say, again, methodologically speaking, both at the intermediate level and the surface level, the, it's, it's more about dualistic thinking. It's about zero-sum competition, okay? It's a, it's a, that's what we've been hearing a lot, in, even in today's uh, uh, summit. Um, and it's, it's about seeking leadership or dominance over others. I must say the three levels are intertwined, but the, the current global tension and the discussion globally on AI and ethics are mostly on the surface and the intermediate levels. Okay, that's, that's how I you know, characterize them. Okay. So honestly, I think without the guidance of the foundational values, this kind of global type of quarreling or maybe, you know, harmonization, you know, put it nicely, will continue for a while. So is there room? So oh. it depends on within, yeah, sorry. Is there room for convergence between the different blocks of the world? Is there room for common definitions, common values? Nicola, do you want to take that one? Uh, yes. Yes, of course, there is room and we have no alternative but to seek common ground. And what I mean by seeking common ground in that uh, context uh, is to imply that we won't agree on everything, okay, which is the beauty of pluralism. Or systems are different, or socioeconomic and cultural fundamentals are different, or values are somehow different. And that's the beauty of pluralism. You know, what we seek to forge in terms of common ground has to reconcile universalism with pluralism. And that's a key challenge. And we should not try and, 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 in a way, universalize everything. And that's the key challenge, articulating what has to be local and plural, what has to be common and, and global. But if I was to you know, put forward what a global agenda and what those common grounds uh, could look like, uh, they, I think we have some, these three blocks of a few things in common, which are reflected into our common uh, goals as expressed, for example, in the 17 Sustainable Development Goal that one 190 countries have approved. So a common agenda could look like uh, this common challenge, trying to reconcile, to align, to combine the ecological and the uh, digital revolutions in ways that do not sacrifice but actually uphold the best from more uh, liberal, social and democratic values. And that's not going to be uh, easy to do. And as again, as I said before, in so doing, we need to uh, find ways to reconcile universalism around particularly fundamental rights, uh, including human rights, and with pluralism. And when I say that, I know that, in a way, the elephant in the room uh, is China here again. And, and I think that Europe's anxiety and, and American anxiety over not negotiating certain concessions with China that could be instrumentalized to justify massive Orwellian abuse is understandable. So we are in a kind of a bind where we see a desire from China to uh, run into a dialogue to forge these common grounds, but we see a lot of prudence on the side of the US uh, and Europe because we don't know, we, we can't really assume how sincere this quest for common ground is. So finding the right, I would say, um, composition of engagement on the one hand and drawing lines on the other hand is what is going to be difficult but at the very least yes we should seek common language common concepts there is so much that we don't understand and we, that we disagree over when we utter the world ai when we try and square up what artific the move from artificial narrow 
to artificial general intelligence. There's so much that even within the Western uh, scientific and, uh, and engineering community that we disagree that there's a lot of common ground to be built around these simple things where, in my view, engaging uh, China uh, would be very, very beneficial. Bing, Bing would you um, like to react to yes. that? Yes. Yes. Uh, in terms of the common grounds, I think the world has already found common grounds in many respects, right? So, um, but as I said, it, it's this, in my framework anyway, the intermediate level, that's where the most cultural differences lie. Um, I think all of us know that um, there must be hundreds <laughs> of uh, AI principles out there already. Um, you know, not just by U.S. and European countries, it's also by Asian countries and, and China as well. In fact, I actually look at the, those principles and then, in fact, they're all generally clustered around um, same five big areas. You know, one of them would be technological solution oriented, like security, safety, explainability, interpretability. The other one is individual rights oriented, privacy, prevention of bias. Okay, the third one is, um, you know, the, the group and relational value oriented, share, collaboration, dialogue, partnership. And then the fourth one is social responsibility related, it's accountability, responsibility. And then the, 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 the sort of a broad sweep principles as well, like democracy, human rights and fairness and humanity. Those last uh, um, category, I would say, with a varying degree of a subscription, okay, globally. Um, I haven't seen any... Um, I haven't seen any uh, uh, um, Chinese AI principles with the democracy in it anyway. So, um, but anyway, so my point is the general consensus has been forged already, but how they are going to be um, interpreted and applied in different cultural contexts, that's a big question mark. Um, I think, you know, um, I know, I know, I think Nicholas is probably, uh, you are optimistic thinking that uh, we could work out the differences but I must say, given the current uh, geopolitical environment, I, I'm actually quite uh, pessimistic <laughs> about working out the differences. Um, and uh, because simply there's a lack of uh, uh, trust of, of each other. It's not just, I mean, you read all this, you know, media stories about China and there is clear, uh, you know, mistrust um, uh, of, of China and Chinese government on the part of the West. But, you know, for the same in fact, there's a huge amount of distrust in China um, on, the, you know, on, on the Western government and all the Western media as well. Really, we are living in a, sort of two parallel worlds in a way. You know what I mean? So um, I'm not saying um, whatever it's being said in the West on China or correct or well placed. In fact, there's a lot of misunderstanding and exaggeration as well. And then likewise, Whatever's been said about the West in China, it's also, you know, uh, exaggeration could be ideologically driven as well. So we live in a very troubled media environment, I must say. So, um, so what, that's why I was talking about, I was trying to see how can we transcend this, this kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of dualistic competition mentality. That's why I was trying to propose this kind of more of a foundational uh, value type of discussion and they really try to bring people together and then and then to see what are the things that really the global community should be working on. Um, that's a starting point for fostering more understanding of each other. So that's why it, a couple uh, concrete examples about the kinds of things that we can talk about. We have plenty of principles already. I think we need to Ideally, I don't know, you could be European Union, could be some other, uh, could be United Nations, could be some NGOs, ideally can lead some sort of a global projects uh, that really involving people from different cultural backgrounds. Let's say, for example, in fact, I asked this question earlier in the earlier session, is about are there possibilities, for example, for US, EU, um, China, maybe Russia as well, to come together to work on something like a, the global pandemic uh, you know, alerting or, uh, you know, um, mechanisms using AI, okay, or some sort of a diagnostics. Um, this is for the benefit of the entire humanity, okay. And then, you know, it's like, uh, it's like there might be uh, alerting regimes uh, relating to earthquakes and tsunamis and stuff. I mean, can we come together uh, to, to develop something that's really of value for the entire humanity rather than, uh, you know, 
I, I know I cannot get rid of the uh, geopolitics. Uh, <laughs> nobody can. Uh, we're in the midst of it. But I just hope that we have more efforts in the global area, in the global uh, efforts, um, so that perhaps, you know, that's a good way of engaging with each other um, and, and, and then, you know, increase understanding. And the second, second area that people can work on is um, weaponization of AI. Um, I think we cannot stop the nations now uh, who are, you know, you know, you know, completely um, uh, overtaken by this geopolitical mentality. This is everybody included, okay? Uh, East and West and China, U.S. and then, you know, included. Um, it's, I just cannot imagine people will stop militarizing AI. I'm sure they continue to do so. But then, but those nations should come together, talk about some of the bottom lines, okay? In times of conflict, what kind of civilian facilities should not be targeted? What kind of, uh, um, you know, critical infrastructures cannot be targeted? You know, some of the floor uh, bottom lines that need to be, uh, you know, reached by uh, all sides, regardless what cultural values and then, uh, you know, uh, political inclinations and the governance systems that you have. So I'm just raising these two examples. I do hope there are a lot more efforts going to that uh, rather than constantly thinking about battling each other. Can I, Sorry. Can I respond? Yeah. Nicholas, yes, I, I, that's, I, yes, that's please, an important please. one. Because here we're seeing two complementary approaches appearing. One is approaching the global collaboration from the top, talking ontologically, metaphysically about the values. And I'm just saying, I don't disagree with that, though I agree with you that there are geostrategic tension that render this approach potentially um, not very efficient because there is this lack of trust where we think that we feel that the other side is instrumentalizing values without substance for their own geostrategic uh, interests. My view is to say that, well, there is a potential to work from the bottom up. Is there common ground across the US, Europe, and uh, China over the need to have self-driving car safe? Probably yes. Not total, but probably yes. Can we agree on the fact that independent audits and certification schemes, there is going to be an industrial competition around those standards, of course, as always, but the very notion of us as a global needing those best practices such as certification and independent audit that renders the manifestation of values and in this case a common value of safety and accountability possible. I think there is potentially a pathway there, but I agree with you that we should not be naive over the ability of these three blocks agreeing on these best practices because there is a lot of it and there is going to be a lot of industrial competition on questions of certification uh, a question of standards in general. But yeah. this, this leads to, to a question. Europe has decided to make values a competitive advantage. So isn't there a tension between Europe saying to the other blocks where our AI is better than yours because it respects values, and on the other hand, trying to find common ground? Isn't there a tension here? I can start if you want. Yes, of course, there is tension. Um, but when I look at the industrial capacity of Europe in the field of AI and compare that industrial capacity with the capacity of China and the US, frankly speaking, we, and I'm speaking as a Frenchman, as a European in this case, we are dwarfed. So we can continue creating the rules of the game and not investing as much energy in, in, in mastering the art of the game. But at the end of the day, those who call the shots are those who master the art of the game. We have, and you have, as a global leading partner, Qualcomm. A fantastic history of an industrial success of a company which has mastered to establish itself as a global technological standard in mobile telecommunication. Their success is industrial. And they are not European. They are not uh, Chinese. So I think that when I look at Europe, and how we can leverage this long-term long bet of trustworthy AI, which I think is the right one. The moment we met that bet, which is a long-term one, we need to realize that we have a, a moral, political uh, obligation to accelerate the industrial development and, and mastering better the art of AI capitalism to be able to compete industrially. Otherwise, Europe will keep on inventing great global common goods in terms of regulation and policy that really help the global consumer. But we also need to look after the, the, the European worker in that situation. And reconciling that long time bet with the reality of our industrial weakness right now 
is really urgent, in my view. Okay. We have one question from the audience. Maybe one of you to have the answer. Uh, it's from Aisha Piotti. Uh, dialogue with China is indeed important. Why is China not a part of the global partnership on AI? I don't know if one of you has to answer to but that. It's been question. said clearly. I, if you look at the way in which. No. Sorry, go, go ahead, Vin. Go ahead. I actually, I don't know why, okay, but I, let, I can offer, by the way, I don't work for the Chinese government, I don't work for any Chinese enterprises or companies, okay, uh, but um, let me offer my point of view based on my observations, okay. What I think is the usual way of um, maybe European and American ways of kind of a, a forging consensus is you start with a declaration, you start with a set of principles and you collect signatures and get people's buying and that kind of thing. Uh, honestly, um, I think, it, especially given the current environment, it's been viewed with a great suspicion. And then, so I do think, um, I, you know, I think it's not a, a oversensitivity on the part of the Chinese that, um, value discussions can be used for the geopolitical reasons, okay, so geopolitical battling. Okay, I think that's not to put, not to be too naive about that. So um, I, I, I'm not too, I mean, I'm just, you know, I just think for coming up with the global, uh, globally shared values and everything, I really do think that, you know, we should involve the participants from day one. Okay, the particip participation from day one is very important. Rather than you work out something, deliver it to somebody, and then that person should sign on and this and that, right? So anyway, so I, that's just my, my view. I, I don't know. Okay, I don't know the official reason. But I do want to go back to the early question that you raised, whether or not there's a bit of a tension between, you know, Europe wanting to lead the value discussion, but at the same time want to say, hey, you know, my values is the, are the best. I do see the problem here. I, I actually... I do see. Um, it's, it's, I'm reading in, in the uh, the um, you know the, I think it's the white paper. It was talking about you know a quote. Why we cannot predict the future of digital technology, European values and ethical rules, social and environmental norms must apply, also in the digital space. I find that statement rather strange, meaning that you don't even know the trajectory of the development, but our values will apply regardless. Um, and then, of course, there were other places to talk about, you know, it was strive to export its values across the world. I used to smell the, the missionary zeal here. I'm sorry, I, I might be offending people here, but I just want to be completely honest and frank here. So I do think if you want to forge global consensus, I think, I think um, you know, we should avoid value arrogance and validity. Okay. We have one minute left. Nicola, do you have one final word before we wrap up this session? Yeah, I can maybe take the, the GPI question. The answer is pretty clear. The, the G7 countries and then expanding beyond the G7 countries express the need to forge an alliance of like-minded countries to work together a vision and a pathway to harness responsibly the power of AI to build you know, society of tomorrow, the future society if you want. And so it's been clearly said, so it's, an, it's a, a choice what meant not to include China to create first a group of black men and countries to define a vision, whether it's good or not, it's a different uh, discussion. But I think that there is room indeed for black men and countries to get together. And there is also very much as a result, a need for global platforms to create bridges and the work that the Secretary General of the UN creating the AI advisory group is doing is exactly that trying to bridge the gap between China, the global south, and the G7 countries and now beyond, which have established this GPA, which is a wonderful initiative to advance the trustworthy adoption of AI for the benefit of uh, humanity. So I think it's, a, at least in my view, it's pretty clear as to why China is not part of GPA. Okay. Well, time is up. Uh, thank you both so much for this very interesting conversation. Um, I will now invite Nicholas Vinokur on the stage for some closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, and, and thanks for that great discussion on, on uh, the 
culture and AI. Um, I want to thank everybody who's been watching today and just offer a couple of points about some of the great discussions we had. Uh, we had Margaret Tevestiger this morning, the top official, top digital official in the EU, uh, saying that she doesn't want to take a ban on facial recognition off the table and that she thinks that certain things are no-go in Europe, like a social scoring system. Uh, we heard about the global AI state of play, uh, including you know the, the words the Cold War that's going on now about technology and what uh, one OECD representative said a hard fight ahead on some of these is these issues. We heard about the limits of technology with with uh, researchers about concepts like general uh, artificial intelligence and super intelligence, whether we'll get there or not. And just now we had this fascinating insight into. Uh, the, the cultural differences and why uh, uh, countries like China are not part of a global a global partnership on on AI and what what are the explanations there and how white might we come together in the future? Um, we are going to be back here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. We very much hope to see you uh, uh, with our discussion. We have a full day of fascinating conversations, and I'm looking forward uh, to to the second day of Politico's third AI summit. Thanks a lot.